We've developed this method for constructing user-valued outcome measures so that the, there's basically two sections to it. The, the, the first part of it is entirely user-led and it's qualitative. So it, it involves focus groups and expert panels and facilitators of focus groups and expert panels who have had the experience of the people in the focus groups, which is what the measure is about. So there's lots and lots of qualitative work. And then that's turned into a mixed methods kind of instrument. And then the second thing is that we do the psychometrics. And you may think, again, that that's not very radical to do psychometrics. Why would anybody bother to do that? Um, I think it is quite important to do it. And nobody would look at it twice if I didn't. But again, it's the way that people respond when they, when they think of what you might be able to do and not do. So there was a woman who, who I met at a meeting and I said, well, I was producing this measure on continuity of care from the service user's perspective. And she said to me, well, service users could never produce a measure because they wouldn't understand factor analysis. You know, like, basically, there's something, <coughs> you're a lesser being when it comes to intellectual life. And also getting this stuff published is impossible. Um, we finally got the first one we did published this year, and it took five years. Sending it out to channels, getting reviews, doing resubmissions, getting rejections. We had all but given up because the, the reviewers could not understand the qualitative part. They could not understand what was important about putting the user voice into the heart of what we were trying. Mean, an outcome measure is hardly a radical thing, but we, we wanted to make ours different. We wanted to make it something that mattered to service users and to produce it through a user-led process. Um, and, and to have nobody involved except service users. But they can't understand that, so they won't publish it. Peter Tyrer is the editor of the British Journal of Psychiatry. And he writes, the engine of user involvement while welcome in principle, may drive mental health research into the sand. He is the editor of the British Journal of Psychiatry, and he thinks service user research in mental health is a fad. And so you can rule that one out if you're a service user researcher and you want your papers published in a peer-reviewed journal. Very, very important is power, which comes back to Mary's point, really, about working in a context where you are, even though I'm a senior lecturer, you know, most, a lot of the people that I work with are much more senior than me. What we generally tend to do when we do these big collaborative projects is that they are collaborative, but we do the user-led bit, and then it fits in to the project as a whole. And nearly always these collaborative so-called projects are headed up by professors of psychiatry or psychology. And Obviously, there are all sorts of issues of status, salary, CVs, things like that, publications. But it's not just that. It's more subtle than that, really. You can just see things that they're doing that are often implicit. They're not actually saying to you, well, I don't think you can hack it because you're a service user. They, don't, they, pro they might think that, but they won't say it. It's the way that, I've, I mean, I've been in a situation with one well-known psychiatrist and a very young service user researcher, very good, was talking about how she wanted to feed back her research to her participants because she felt that when non-service users did research, mainstream researchers never tell the participants anything about the results. So she was talking about wanting to feed back to her participants, have meetings, have newsletters and things like that. And he just said to her, you're such an idealist. And that is just such a put down, you know. And, and it is like they're saying, well, who are you? you know, what is your identity here? What is your right to be here? So are you a researcher or are you a patient? And you're not really a researcher, are you really? Because you're tainted by this identity of patient. And, and I can... I sometimes, well, I think, you know, maybe I'm being paranoid here, quite likely, and almost the thought forming in their head 
I wonder what your diagnosis is then. You just see them kind of looking for symptoms and, and trying to figure out what the problem might be. So it's not just that I feel I can't say, I can't have you know, straight arguments. There's all these little mind games that go on and, and about your status as a service user and about your identity. And that really does undermine what you do and means that it doesn't have credibility and isn't taken seriously. And that's the struggle, really. And that's why I'm kind of saying to you, well, maybe this doesn't, all this doesn't sound terribly radical to you. Um, but it is a real struggle in the domain of psychiatry to get any of this in the door. There is something called the Cochrane hierarchy of evidence for which a randomised controlled trial is the gold standard. The randomised controlled trial is held to be the gold standard because of something called blinding. So it has two arms. Say it's a medication trial. One group gets the medication, the other group gets a placebo. The people getting the medication are not supposed to know which arm they're in, and the researchers are not supposed to know which arm the participants are in. So assessments of benefit and side effects, the participants and the researchers are supposed to be blind to which condition the people are in. And that's supposed to mean that you get absolutely objective results. The reason I was going to tell you a lot about our outcome measures is that I don't think RCTs are neutral at all. Because, you know, what comes as a good, what counts, what counts for, as a good outcome? Um, the outcome measures divided by clinicians may not be the things that matter to service users. They may not be the things that matter to social workers come to that. Um, and that's why we put all this work into trying to develop user-valued and user-generated outcome measures, which do look quite different to the ones that are generated by clinicians. So I think in that sense, um, randomised control trials aren't neutral at all. And anyway, even the blinding process usually breaks down. Because if you're taking a drug, you can generally tell you're taking it because you'll have effects you don't like. And if you're taking nothing, well, actually, if you're taking a placebo, you generally get a bit better. <laughs> and, you know, and say you're taking a drug that has manifest side effects in your movement, the researcher knows. And, and in more complicated interventions, like psychological interventions, quite often the participants tell the researcher that they, they'll drop into the conversation the name of the person that's doing the intervention. So quite a lot of the time, it's called breaking the blind. And breaking the blind happens an awful lot. So that RCTs are kind of the top of the hierarchies of evidence. Then there are observational ex experiments, observational studies, can't remember. I don't think qualitative comes anywhere. Right at the bottom is what they call expert opinion. And an expert opinion accounts for evidence, but only as the weakest form. And the experts are always men in grey suits who are psychiatrists. This is the way that DSM-3 was drawn up. When they decided that they no longer wanted psychoanalysis in DSM, and they wanted um, more Krippelian categories. They just got famous psychiatrists in committee rooms and got them to draw up the diagnostic categories for DSM-3, based on no research whatsoever, just based on their clinical judgment and their opinion. Um, and it's still happening. I'm in the unfortunate position of having given a talk on consumers' perspectives on diagnosis and what they should be doing about consulting consumers about updating to DSM-5. I keep telling them they've got to consult all over the place, but I have this absolutely horrible feeling that the consultation is yours truly. <laughs> Something like drawing up the DSMs on the basis of just somebody's opinion, their knowledge, their history, their judgment, that does count as evidence. But it's a weak form of evidence, and, and the only evidence, come, the only people who count as experts are psychiatrists. If we were to admit user knowledge as expertise, then we'd have a different 
knowledge base and knowledge production. And, you know, someday, when 10 years hence, after I'm retired, when all this is going swimmingly, we can revisit the Cochrane hierarchy. Bias. The bane of my life. I was asked to write a theme piece for the British Journal of Psychiatry, no, BMJ, on um, being a user researcher. And the woman who asked me to do it said, you have to understand that most people think that what you do is biased, anecdotal, and that you're over-involved. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that basically is what a lot of people think. And I'll just give you the example of a conference, NMESH, I can't, don't know what the acronym stands for, but it's a European group evaluating mental health services that has a conference every two years. And they had one in London a while back. And there was a user-led stream and Judy Chamberlain came over and talked and there was a lot of user-led research presented and they engaged a journalist to write up the conference. And the journalist's um, section on the user-led stream was that it was anecdotal and biased. That's what she wrote down. I was walking to dinner with a guy from the Netherlands and I was telling him what I did. And he said, to me, oh, yes, but all this user involvement in research is just political correctness, isn't it? So, I mean, this is the sort of thing that you have to cope with. I think you'll have gathered by now, I don't pretend to be neutral. I don't pretend that I'm coming from some neutral, objective place where, what, where my history has no effect on the knowledge I produce. I don't pretend to be neutral. I don't think any service user researcher pretends to be neutral. I don't believe anybody can be neutral. I mean, the people who do research at the Institute of Psychiatry, who do randomised controls trials and all that kind of thing, they're invested in it. You know, I know somebody who does something called cognitive remediation therapy, and I asked her once why she did it. And she said, because the people I do it with have the poorest outcomes and I want to help them. And she worked her heart out doing trials of this therapy. She's invested in it, just like I'm invested in mine. You know, she has it, but she doesn't have the same kind of historical, the same history with an involvement in the user movement and experience of being a mental health service user, but she has a history as well. Um, and many mental health researchers do what they do because they have mental health problems in their families or amongst close friends. So it's just daft to say we're over-involved, as if everybody else wasn't over-involved. I get the impression that some people that I work with basically think that we can't engage, we can't engage in science, because science is the supremely rational activity, and we're not rational. So how can we be scientists? Now, nobody would say that out loud, and probably no one would articulate it in their thoughts. It's just a kind of underground sense that you get that there is something going on here about the, the connection between rationality and science and how that excludes people who are designated irrational. There is user involvement in other medical specialities, not as developed as in mental health, not as controversial as in mental health. Outcome measures tend to be agreed as between con doctors and patients. You know, everybody with cancer wants to live as long as possible and have a good quality of life. So I think outcome measures are always agreed between psychiatrists and people with mental health problems. People with physical disorders believe that randomised control trials are the best method. I don't. And I think a lot of this comes from the fact that it's, psychiatry itself is controversial because of the power it has over the people who, with whom it's charged with looking after. I think we've, it's more difficult for us to find legitimacy and credibility because of this taint of irrationality than consumer researchers in other medical disciplines, although I also think they're not going nearly as far. Loads and loads of studies are being done now. We're not unique anymore. I mean, the UK is way ahead. <coughs> and of anywhere, even America, 
The UK is way ahead in terms of user research. Stuff going on in Australia, stuff going on in New Zealand, stuff going on in, this, in um, the States, but not as much as here. You know, there's nowhere like Sure at the Institute of Psychiatry. There's nowhere like Sure Search at Birmingham that I know of. And, I mean, there are units that I know of, but the UK is far, far ahead in a whole range of things, a whole range of disciplines, a whole range of methods being carried out. I don't know how you feel, those of you who are professionals, identify as professionals, and those of you who identify as service users, if it's a struggle to make that partnership work. I certainly think it's a struggle to make the partnership work, and I have had strong criticism from other service user researchers. Saying that SHIR is a collaboration in some people's eyes means collaboration in a negative sense. That it's, you're being co-opted, especially if you work in a place like the Institute of Psychiatry. Um, you've lost your radical edge. I find that very upsetting. I never knew how to respond to that um, when it was said to me. And then I thought, this, this is implying that we can't stand up for ourselves. It implies that we can't have the argument with the people that we disagree with. OK, there are all these power difficulties. And, but we can stand up for ourselves. And plenty of people are prepared to have the argument. We may not win it every time, but nobody does and win all arguments. I think you end up having a, a kind of difficult double identity. Of course, lots of people have multiple identities, but in this, in this specific field. Research, researchers think you're a service user, as I've explained, and service users think you're a researcher. So you have to try and be both and combine the two identities. You have to learn to be a bit of a translator and anybody who can speak two languages knows that's quite hard. I don't know if I've lost the plot in terms of the service user movement because it's such a long time since... I mean, I used to go regularly to my local service user group, but now it's a two-hour journey from work and it meets at four o'clock in the afternoon. It's logistically impossible to get there. I get the monthly newsletter and I read it and all the rest of it, but, you know, I'm not involved as I used to be, and that's, that's a shame. Okay, first of all, theory and facts. Um, what is it? What's theory? Um, give the example, there's a group called the Survivor History Group, and they have email lists, like lots of groups do, and they have a thread called Theory of Our History. And one of the threads is, do we need theory or don't we? And the academics, there aren't very many um, on the list, say, yes, we need a theory, by which they usually mean some kind of neo-Marxist thing. Um, and some survivors say, no, we don't need theory at all. We just need our facts. The moderator of the list has constructed a website. I advise you to visit it. It is the most... Have you visited... It is the most incredible website. And he adds to it all the time. But he calls it a timeline. That's what he calls it. He calls it a timeline. And the ti it, it is a timeline. It has a structure. It has a narrative. And it is sequential. It is in dates. And I would say, you know, a theory underlies this. The history unfolds in a certain way. And that is a theory. And... Then, so all I'm trying to say at this point is there's no such thing as facts, bare facts, without theory. So we have to take that on board for a start. And that applies to everyday life as well. It would be impossible <coughs> to assimilate everything around us in its raw sense. We have to find patterns and meanings. This is what I think might be a useful starting point for building a theoretical underpinning for survivor research. So it's a body of work called Feminist Standpoint Epistemology. What's epistemology? It's a kind of framework for producing truths and deciding what counts as a truth. And Feminist Standpoint Epistemology is concerned with the position of women in science. 
and the main authors from the States are Sandra Harding and Nancy Hartsock, and the main author from England is Hilary Rose. And this is what they argue. The argument is that science and society have rested on a series of oppositions, and they are things like reason versus unreason, intellect versus emotion, culture versus nature, and so on. And what feminist standpoint argue is that science privileges the first term, reason, intellect, culture, as opposed to the second term, and that these are seen as male attributes. So science, has a, science is ma masculinist. And sometimes this means that actual women, women are excluded from science, real individual women. And an example of that is Rosalind Franklin, who was co-discoverer with um, Crick and Watson of the structure of DNA, the double helix. But she, her name didn't appear in any of the papers. So that's an example of an actual woman being written out of a very important scientific discovery. But they're also arguing that because science has this masculine um, set of attributes, the knowledge has a masculine slant, even when some women are included in the production of knowledge. So Hilary Rose has written this book called Love, Power and Knowledge. Power and Knowledge being great subject of academic debate. So what she's trying to do is insert something more, not feminine, but something less masculinist into the debate by calling her book Love, Power and Knowledge. So can we use this, is what I'm wondering. I think we might be able to. We can argue that these oppositions, reason, unreason, intellect, emotion, culture, nature, that's just three, there are more, that they apply even more strongly to those designated maps. We are allocated the attributes of unreason, emotion, and being closer to brute nature than people not so designated. There's a lot written these days about something called othering. Um, but I think there's an argument for saying that People designated mad are the ultimate other, which is why I put a capital of Foucault in his book, Madness and Civilization. He argues that with the rise of the concept of reason in the Enlightenment, this discourse also had to produce its opposite. It needed its opposite in order to sustain itself. So the mad were chosen as its antithesis and positioned as unreason. And what that meant, according to Foucault, was inability to think rationally. That's unreason. But also because such a premium was being put on labour in the 18th and 19th century, inability to labour. So therefore did houses of confinement come about. A lot of sociologists are arguing that there's been a paradigm shift in society in the post-war period. Now this is lots of things post-Fordism, all this kind of thing, that our society has changed. But in terms of psychic life, they say that all kinds of self are now possible. And that a fragmented self is emblematic of postmodern society. So there shouldn't be a problem about being mad, basically. If all sorts of selves are possible, and fragmented self is fine, we shouldn't worry anymore, really. Is it though? Yes, and some people argue that things have shifted and a mad self is now possible to be positive about being mad. I don't think it's the whole story though, because especially in the last few years, there is now a premium put on something called capacity in psychiatric discourse. And lack of capacity is, was supposed, was going to be the reason that would underpin the new Mental Health Act. The Richardson Committee, who wrote the first report on updating the Mental Health Act, said that lack of capacity should be the criterion on which people could be, should be detained. Lack of capacity seems to me a designation of unreason, equally lack of insight. So I don't think, actually, that they have gone away. I don't think unreason has disappeared. Maybe it's being, maybe everything's becoming more unstable because there are oppositional and 
things like creative work and the user movement and Andrew Rob Roberts' timeline and all the rest of it. But this, this still, it's, it's still for a lot of people, you know, lack of capacity, lack of insight is something that dominates their lives in their interactions with psychiatry. So I don't think really that the postmodern self has reached all of us. So what about use of produced knowledge? I think we can adapt feminist standpoint to epistemology and that this gives a, this would provide a theoretical underpinning and that would allow us to have an argument with dominant psychiatric discourse, except that psychiatric discourse doesn't think it has an epistemology. I mean, you've mentioned, the lady in the red, you've mentioned positivism. They don't know they're positivists. I mean, to the average and at the high profile researcher at the Institute of Psychiatry who is doing randomized control trials, they don't reflect at all. They don't think they have an epistemology. What they do is obviously objective to them. So it's actually quite difficult to have the conversation if you're going to start unpicking their epistemology and then telling them what they should be doing. But nothing is obvious, as far as I know. And actually, this applies to us too. You know, we have to, be, have to reflect and we have to be self-critical and not think we've got all the answers. And just because other people won't be self-critical and other people won't reflect doesn't mean we shouldn't. Okay, I've got a couple of slides on criticisms of this approach. It's been argued that it's relativist, that any body of ideas is as good as any others. So feminist produced knowledge and male produced knowledge, they're different but equal. Harding has an interesting argument here. She argues that feminist research and thinking is actually, she uses the word objective, I would use the word comprehensive. Um, is actually more objective because it can enter both dominant scientific discourse and its own. So it's more comprehensive in terms of the scope of the work that it can do. And I think we do that too. We know very well, because we have to read the papers, we know very well how the discourse of psychiatric research functions, but we also know how our own discourse functions. And, and so the picture that we have of the knowledge we produce is wider and more comprehensive. It's been said that this approach, standpoint epistemology, implies that knowledge springs unproblematically from the essence of women or the essence of mad people, I think. And the answer to that has usually been that knowledge varies according to things like gender, ethnicity and class. So working class women or black women produce a different knowledge base to white middle class women would be the feminist point of view. These are sociological categories to me and I think they fail. So now I'm going to be really controversial and you're not going to like this at all. Given everything that I said, what is the status of the concept of experts by experience? I've always been really uncomfortable with this concept. At its worst, it implies that people who have experienced distress and used mental health services have a homogenous experience. If that experience differs, the most that people seem to be able to say is that it differs according to sociological categories like class, gender and ethnicity. But I think many things can inflect the experience that we end up with that are not sociological categories, because experience is never raw. Experience never comes, is never untransparent. And there is this concept, that it's an old concept, um, from neo-Marxism, called conditions of existence, which is when neo-Marxists were grappling with the relationship between the means of production and ideology. And um, because the standard Marxist text was that the means of production determine ideology and the superstructure. And people like Althusser were saying, well, there's a relative autonomy and then there was more autonomy and so, and so on and so on. So they developed this concept of conditions of existence. And you can think of all sorts of different things that inflect the experience of people who experience distress and who use mental health services. 
including conditions imposed by different forms of psychiatry. I mean, we talk about psychi psychiatrists as if they're all the same. Actually, they're not. You know? And also, it makes a big difference if you're socially isolated or if you're involved in collective conceptualizations at an ideological level. But I don't want, what I really don't want to say is that we're all individuals. Because that seems to be what everybody says. Oh, everything has to be individualized. We need personalization. We need individualized treatment. We're all individuals. We all need different things. I don't believe it. You know, we do share things. We just share things. It's still about collectivities, but it's about diverse collectivities. And, and these di diverse collectivities, finally, I can't do it yet, but I'll try in the next few months to link back to what I said earlier about the self and identity. <laughs>